Section 4 of Astounding Stories 14, February 1931 By Various This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Werewolves of War by D. W. Hall Part D Lance hung for a moment at one thousand feet. A crack of lightning lit the base below for a second, and he perceived the colonel's straight figure with hand outstretched. Lance grinned and gunned to forty thousand an easy flying height with his superchargers pumping and air rectifiers normalizing the enclosed pilot's seat but what he wondered as he stopped the helicopters did he mean by give a last handshake he was soon to find out behind him in the fuselage nestled the weird cluster of machinery which was the singe beacon it certainly did not look imposing a mass of spidery tubes mazing round a bulky black box which was, Lance guessed, some new type of generator. Out of the top of the device sprouted a funnel-like horn, from which, on the adjustment of the beacon's control studs, shot the nullifying ray. Lance could not suppress a shiver as he thought of the earth-shaking cataclysm that ray would conjure from the infinitely high heavens. At forty thousand feet he was above the storm clouds, whose pitchy, vapor-drenched blackness effectively blanked out all sign of the earth. He might have been flying in outer space. Keeping a careful eye on his instruments, he set a course for Sola Ranch. He kept his speed around three hundred, wishing to meet Hay exactly at nine. But would Hay be there? How much did the Slavs know? How much had Ranth got through before he stopped him? A frown creased his brow. It was best not to puzzle over that question, best just to go ahead and keep going. At about three minutes to nine he set the plane's nose down through veils of clammy cloud. This was the mountainous country, sparsely patrolled by Slav ships. Lance hovered cautiously over the furred mountain tops, getting his directions, shooting wary eyes through the magnifying mirrors in search of enemy scouts. He saw none. Satisfied, he cut the raw diesels, gunned the helicopter props, and dropped lightly down on the stubby field of Sola Ranch. To left and right loomed the dim outlines of the lonely mountains. Before the war the owner of Sola Ranch had grown apples. This field had housed a few horses. It made a perfect landing place, secluded, misty with the clinging mountain vapors, far apart from the war. Lance felt like a prowling werewolf there, waiting for its ghostly mate. Rain was still splattering in desultory bursts, but distance muted the rumbling salvos of thunder. His watch told him it was one minute to nine. Now what? Hay or a swooping squadron of Slav planes? Lance stepped out of the cockpit into the rain, though holding himself tensely ready to leap back again and soar away. He stared around and peered above. Was that a shadow? A nightmare flying bird? Or a plane? He grasped a hand flash and rapidly signaled his identity. The next instant it seemed the shadow wavered, then fell earthward with great speed. Out of the gloom and rain it came, an enemy plane. It dropped down beside his scout. From its cockpit came a few swift flashes of light. Hey! Lance ran eagerly over to the other plane, and out from its enclosed cabin stepped the man he had known as Prod. Wordlessly they gripped hands. Hay's thin, straight face wore a smile, and he met Lance's eyes keenly. Lance stammered, S Sorry, Captain Hay, about— about the way I treated you at the base. You see, I had no idea who you were." Hay cut short his apologies with a laugh. Rot? I'd have been the same way myself. He glanced rapidly at Lance's plane. Got it? he questioned. I'm a bit late. Had a hell of a time getting here without arousing suspicion. We'd best hurry. Lance nodded. They hurried to the goshawk. As they worked, carefully lifting out the singe beacon, Lance, in crisp, short-clipped sentences, told his companion of Ranth, the spy. "'You don't know how much he got through?' "'No,' said Lance. "'No.' "'Hm. Well, we'll have to trust to luck.' "'You know the working of the beacon?' Lance asked. On the other's nod of affirmation, he continued. "'What's your plan?' "'Light about five miles this side of Frisco itself, just near the main Slav military base. Anywhere in that territory would do, though.' The beacon doesn't go up in a narrow ray. It spreads, diffuses. 
The squadron of torpedoes will cover some fifty or sixty miles of ground, I believe. They'll utterly demolish the city, and every damned Slav in it. His face in the darkness went grim and hard, and it'll damn well pay them back, he rasped, for the horrible way they massacred San Francisco's population. The singe beacon was in his plane. Hay turned to Lance, stretching out his hand for a farewell clasp. Then Lance asked the question that had been worrying him. Colonel Douglas told me to give you a last handshake for him. Last? Why did he say that? Because, Hay said smilingly, I'm staying by the beacon to make sure that nothing goes wrong. I guess that's why he said it, old fellow. Lance gasped. You're sacrificing your life? Of course. To save seventy-five million others. Then suddenly they both stared above. A roar of sound, of purring motors, of props, mixed with the chatter of a dozen machine-guns, had belched with numbing suddenness from the low-hanging clouds. Enemy planes! A patrol of them! God! jerked Lance. Rance's warning got through. Part of it, anyway. He leaped for his plane, shouting, I'll hold him off! You get away quick! And through a veritable hail of lead sprang into the cockpit. Then a cold pang at his heart. He sprang out again. A bullet had caught Hay. For a moment the Slav fire ceased, while their planes zoomed up to start another death-dealing dive, and in that moment Lance was at Hay's side, where he had fallen. "'They got me,' whispered Hay, a stream of blood welling from his gasping mouth. "'I'm—I'm I'm going. C carry me to—to to your plane. I've still a little strength left. You take the beacon.' I'll hold them as, as long as I can. Put through that beacon, boy. Put it through." His brain a maelstrom, Lance stared at the crumpled figure. It was the only way. He heard the motors above come roaring down again. Desperately he carried the blood-choking hay to his own plane, propped him limply at the controls. Bullets spat through a frenzy of noise. Weakly hay started the goshawks' diesels and weakly into Lance's face smiled, and beckoned him to leave. And as Lance, a grim resolve at his heart, turned, Hay's blood-frothed lips formed the words, Carry on. Through the raining lead, seeming to bear a charmed life, Lance leaped to Hay's plane, hearing as he did so his own, with a stricken pilot at its controls, hurtle upwards. Carry on, for the life of America. Carry on. Ten minutes past the hour of nine, a full thousand miles behind the lines on the wide black field of America's major war base, a small group of men stood, surveying the awesome weapons assembled there. Row upon row of huge, dully, gleaming, cigar-shaped things stretched away into darkness before them. There were only one or two faint lights to give illumination, and the night choked in on them, making them terrifying. They resembled, more than anything else, half-sized dirigibles, being roughly about one hundred feet long and perhaps as much as thirty feet high. At first sight they seemed to be numberless. Then, as the bewildered eye became more sane, one could count them and see that there were, in reality, about thirty. Their prows were stubby. In the port side of each a tiny trap-door yawned, and standing by every trap-door was the overall-clad figure of a mechanic waiting for the signal. The commander of the American Air Force looked up from his wristwatch. At his side was a peculiar gnome-like figure, a figure with hunched, twisted back and huge, over-heavy head. This was Professor Singe, and from that ridiculous head had come the germ which had finally expanded into the torpedoes arrayed before him. His eyes were nervous, his crooked face twitched ceaselessly. Time? he kept asking. Time? Is it yet time? and finally the tall figure of the commanding officer turned and rapped, Time. An aide-de-camp raised a hand. As if working by some mechanical device, the figure which stood by each torpedo climbed through the trap-doors, jumped out a second later, and came running to the head of the field. About thirty seconds, muttered Singe nervously, eyes alight, thirty seconds for their motors to catch the stream. Thirty. Ah! for the squadron of man-made horrors had stirred. "'God pity San Francisco,' murmured the commanding officer, and stepped back involuntarily, 
as the whole fleet lifted their glyco scarzite crammed bellies from the field and as if moved by some magical unseen unheard force shot up into the darkness with ever-gathering speed god pity it indeed chuckled singe exultantly it'll need it the c o sighed and shook his head slowly war he mused and yet it's our only chance for a moment he paused seemingly unconscious of the macabre little form next to him still gazing aloft at the now invisible torpedoes and then muttered and god pity basil hay who's giving his life to america a glorious unselfish hero god pity basil hay american flyers never knew of basil hay's last fight had they it would have become legendary for hay fought a grim battle against two foes one he could face and conquer as he had conquered often before but the other lurked next to his dauntless heart and it hay could not subdue it was death truly hay's fight there in the wet clouds above sola ranch was an inspired one he fought almost by instinct alone instinct twenty years of piloting had planted deep in his veins he fought for lance for america his eyes glazing rapidly could not distinguish the roaring phantoms that laced around his lone plane but uncannily his burst of fire went home again and again while theirs ripped aimlessly over the goshawk's hell-driven snout of course it could not last gallant spirit alone kept basil hay taut at his controls spirit alone thrust back the ever-increasing surge of black oblivion that pounded at his heart and brain spirit alone sent the pitifully outnumbered plane corkscrewing and peerless maneuverings that baffled the onpassing slavs and thrust four of them to the sodden ground in flame spirit that would not surrender but had to they could never have conquered basil hay in a plane an ambushing bullet that caught him off guard did that and finally hay fell but he had kept them for full ten minutes ten minutes each one a lasting mute testimony to his unquenchable unyielding spirit he flung a last salvo from his hot machine guns then heart numbing jerked back the control stick and careened high he slumped down the plane paused wallowing crazily for a moment and then roared earthward carry on formed faintly on its dead pilot's bloody lips basil hay had fought his last fight ten minutes lance hadn't expected that long he thought hay would die in a few seconds the man was mortally wounded could not last nevertheless minutes or seconds he was entrusted with the singe beacon and it was his job and his will to put it through he climbed the slav plane up to its ceiling driven it till it simply refused to go higher and then roared on towards san francisco each second he expected to see others come hurtling after him when they did not he knew how really great hay's will was it was an inspiring example but his brain was tortured by a multitude of conflicting doubts a patrol of slav scouts had ambushed them just how much did the slavs know then about the torpedoes he lance had to guide the singe beacon quickly he reviewed what hay had told him light about five miles this side of frisco anywhere in that territory would do though the beacon doesn't go up in a narrow ray it spreads diffuses spreads diffuses hay had been clad in slav uniform and thus could with a certain measure of safety put the beacon machinery on the ground itself but lance was in an american uniform if he landed he ran great risk of being noticed and attacked at once lance saw immediately that there was only one way out it was sure death but hay had expected death and so must he his lips set in stern resolve it meant good-bye farewell to the girl he'd left behind farewell to life farewell to everything but not for a second did he debate the course he would take lance glanced at his watch nine thirty the torpedoes were even now on their way hurtling along miles above the earth in fifteen minutes they would be over san francisco in fifteen minutes the singe beacon had to meet them he was not familiar with the slav plane's instruments but he judged he'd traveled some hundred and twenty-five miles was nearing the outskirts of san francisco the air below would be thick probably with enemy scouts but his appearance should pass unchallenged as long as they didn't glimpse his betraying uniform he set the plane's nose down in a long slanting dive 
Whipping through the clouds, the guarding search rays of San Francisco were soon visible. Lance saw a few patrols of enemy scouts. He clung to the clouds, decreased his speed, and began circling over the heart of the metropolis itself. Twenty to ten. Occasionally a Slav plane flashed by him. Thank God they didn't challenge. Lance went still lower. Finally, at a thousand feet, he set the helicopter props in motion and hung in mid-air, directly above the very center of the city. Sixteen minutes to ten. Now. In the American front-line trenches, massed troops crouched expectantly. Clustered on every air base were flights of planes, each one crammed with bombs. Far behind, the Yank gun crews edged nervously up to their mighty charges and fingered anxiously the stubby gas shells which would soon be flung through the dripping night. And at base number five, a very uneasy Colonel Douglas paced back and forth in his office, muttering, No news from Lance. No news from Lance. God, he can't have failed. But why doesn't he show up? He had not failed. Hovering in the plane over San Francisco, Lance squirmed round in his seat, reached back into the fuselage, and pressed rapidly the studs on the single beacon. A high, whining noise pierced instantly through the plane, and upstabbed the beacon, invisible, deadly, up, up, up to a thin realm miles above where it flashed into an awesome squadron of terrible shells of steel, shells that a second later wavered, staggered, and plunged earthward and Lance tensed in his seat. From above he caught a tiny whistling noise, a whistling that hurtled into a terrific shriek that roared ever closer. "'Carry on,' he muttered. "'Carry on.' The words froze on his lips, for the world was suddenly consumed, it seemed, by flame and splitting, bellowing thunder. The American guns spoke. From every aerodrome long flights of scouts and bombers and transport planes roared upwards. In the front trenches the troops, still somewhat dazed by the earth-shaking explosion that had just tumbled from the far horizon, a horizon still lit by leaping tongues of awful flame, poured over the top, gas masks on, repeaters and portable machine guns at the ready, with a fierce cry on their lips. Before that avenging attack the Slavs, their very spine broken, bewildered and confused, already turning in panic, could not stand. America swept to the Pacific and left death in her wake. And when she came to San Francisco, not even the sternest fighting men, still hot from battle, could repress a shudder. So awful was the devastation. The Slav invasion was over. In the rebuilt city of San Francisco there was a statue that stands proudly before the magnificent gleaming city hall. It represents two slim, straight-standing figures, clad in the uniform of the American Air Force. Their outstretched arms support a tiny one-seater Gossok fighting plane. Below, as you know, there is a plaque. Men touch their hats as they walk by it. Flowers are always fresh at its base. On the plaque are the words, To the everlasting memory of Captain Basil Hay, AAF, Captain Derek Lance, AAF, who in the War of 1938 gave their lives in destroying and devastating San Francisco, that San Francisco and America might live. End of Part D and End of Werewolves of War by D. W. Hall